While we were at the Rocky Mountain Blacksmithing Conference last week, we had the privilege of watching the master blacksmith, Peter Ross, create this scroll. And we shared some of that here on YouTube, although we didn't get the entire project, but we got some of it. But before Peter did this scroll, he talked for a little while about 18th century blacksmithing and how that related to his job as the master blacksmith at Colonial Williamsburg. And I have some of that on video. I think I have most of that talk. And I thought I would share that with you today. However, there is a bit of a disclaimer. Um, this was shot with me as a member of the audience. The talk was not put on for me to video. I did not have the ability to put a microphone on Peter. I couldn't interrupt the, the demonstration to get the best camera shots. So the camera angle is just what it is. The sound is just what it is. And hopefully you can still enjoy it and still get something out of Peter's talk, even though the, the video and the audio is not going to be as good as I would like it to be. So let's take a look at what Peter had to say a couple of weeks ago at the 2018 Rocky Mountain Blacksmithing Conference. He's the master blacksmith at Gloria Williamsburg for many years. He is, if, he is one of, if not the guy to go to to learn about colonial work, 18th century ironwork. And we're, uh, we're so happy to have him back again. Please join me in welcoming Peter Ross. Scottish parents' home. Uh, 
So they were apparently taken down all the house in Scotland, brought to America, and set up in this house, and they're still there. So it's a pretty cool survival. Uh, These are reproductions. The ones we're looking at are reproductions, yes. Yeah, the originals are, well, they're not mine, first of all, and second, <laughs> far too valuable to get passed around and uh, slobbered on like this. <laughs> that house, the one that loves the park, or the one that's right the uh, the house belongs to Colonial Amesburg Foundation. It's not open for tours. So, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about Williamsburg and my time there. and That will maybe give you some context for how I'm going to talk about this stuff. So, uh, so I worked at Colonial Williamsburg for 25 years. Uh, I was the master of the blacksmith shop for 23 of them. Uh, and it's a nonprofit corporation. Uh, it's uh, it's one of it's a very rare kind of uh, situation in America. It was actually the capital city of Virginia from 1699 until the middle of the Revolutionary War. Uh, it's a real town, uh, and then the capital. There was a threat, a military threat to the capital in 1780, and so in a flurry of panic, they moved the capital inland to Richmond to hopefully keep it from being sort of uh, ransacked by the British, who had control of the water on the, on the coast of America during the war. So uh, moved the capital to, to Richmond, where it still is now, and so Williamsburg ceased to be the important political center of the colony or the state. Uh, and um, that was really its only reason for prominence. It's not a transportation center. It's not at the crossroads of anything important. It's not a port. It's not. Doesn't have a good view. <laughs> don't have any good restaurants. I was there in the <laughs> There's nothing, nothing to make it. Well, they, in fact, they picked that location to be the capital in 1699 because the current capital was Jamestown and it built in a swamp. And so they said, we're done with this swamp. We're going to find a dry place. And they picked the highest point of land they could nearby, which was Williamsburg. That's 80 feet. Eight, eight, eight zero. Eight, eight zero. Well, when do you get out of breath? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's on the drainage divide for the peninsula that it's on. So Williamsburg was the driest spot. There was already a college there, the College of William and Mary. Uh, there was supposedly already a blacksmith shop there and uh, an ordinary tavern. So that's the, that was the... Uh, the critical mass, I guess, for picking a capital city location. And that's where it was. So anyway, once they moved the capital, there was really nothing left there to make Williamsburg prosper. And so it didn't. It just stayed pretty much the same for the next 150 years. And in the 1920s, uh, well, you, you know, there's something happened, something kind of important happened in, July 1776. Anyway, <laughs> every 50, uh, well, after 100 years after that, there was a huge celebration called the Centennial. Big celebration in Philadelphia. The 150th anniversary, there was great celebration and uh, revival of interest in colonial things. And, early American things, early American politics. And so in the 1920s, um, one of the Rockefellers bought, essentially bought up the town to preserve it before it got modernized. Because in this town were still 90 or 100 18th century buildings uh, that hadn't been altered much. And so 
so this was one of the few towns that could be sort of restored to its 18th century appearance without, uh, well, without having to rebuild the whole thing. And Williamsburg, being the capital in the lead up to the Revolutionary War, was the home of a number of important political events. So uh, the Virginia legislature included Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George With, and other Declaration of Independence signer, uh, some uh, prominent names were Virginia politicians at the time. And a lot of important events kind of were formulated there. So, uh, so that's why they picked Williamsburg. And uh, essentially it got bought up by Rockefeller, uh, and then the houses were all purchased one at a time, and it became, it became a nonprofit corporation with the mission of preserving what was there and sort of portraying what it might have been like in, in the years before the Revolutionary War. So that's the place. When I worked there, my job was to uh, make the things that were needed by the rest of the museum. So there were 25 other trades shops, wheelwrights, shoemakers, gunsmiths. Um, they all needed the correct kinds of tools for 1770. Uh, and and uh, not too many other people making them. And so that was part of my job. The other part was to try to figure out how those things had been made in 1770 and try to relearn that process. So you, you could certainly make a, you know, here's a typical pair of compasses, for example, from that era. You, you could, I mean, Nowadays, you could make these on a CNC machine. And if you were really good at it, you could get pretty close to an original appearance. But that wasn't really the goal. The goal was to try to figure out how they had been made and try to relearn the skills well enough to duplicate the process as well as the product. All those things were important. And then, of course, you could show that to jurors so they could you know there are a lot of people who would say oh i'd love to see a cnc machine making one of these but there are more tourists who would say i'd love to see a blacksmith making one of these the way they used to do it so that that was our goal and that was our appeal uh, and challenge so uh, I could talk more at some point about some of the other kinds of things we made. Well, actually, I brought a couple with me. We can pass some of these around too. So here's some, uh, here's some hardware. Uh, these cooking utensils I made up. They're they're made in the style of, but they're not actual copies of any old stuff. And here's a, a couple of things: a lock and a latch. Yeah. yeah, so these are typical of the goods that you find being made and used at that time. And uh, I've talked about this often before, but I think it's really important to say again. When these things were being made in 1770, uh, if, if someone if you went to look at one of these in the store and the storekeeper said, those are handmade, how much of a big deal do you think that was back then? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Everything's handmade. You know, what's the big deal? Get over it, they would say. So there's no novelty back then for something being handmade. And, and there's nothing about that automatically makes it special. So that that's a very different environment than most of uh, everyone here today is accustomed to thinking about. Most people today are sort of riding this wave of, oh, it's handmade, so it must be wonderful. Handmade by itself implies 
special, unusual, incredible, soul, you know, enriching, wallet enriching. Anyway, there. This, all of the attributes that people today associate with handmade didn't apply at all. And so the style or the aesthetic for making these things back then did not make attempt to emphasize the thing being handmade. And often, in fact, if there's some evidence of it being handmade, you want to get rid of that because to make, to make a piece and leave marks and leave evidence is the lowest level of skill. So if I draw, if I work on a bar of iron, I can, I can give this piece of iron to my 10-year-old grandson and say, put hammer marks on that. And he can do that in the dark with his eyes closed without ever having known what a hammer was before that moment. That doesn't take any skill at all. And so you want to show skill. You want to raise your work above the lowest possible level of appreciation. You want to do it in a way that takes more skill. And that means making a cleaner, uh, smoother, more regular result. Because that takes more skill than making an irregular one does. I'm talking about the forging skill. I'm not talking about aesthetic design or, or style necessarily. So that was the, that was the um, sort of aesthetic. That was the standard of quality for those days. It's the pieces that are forged are forged smooth and clean. The forged surface is the lowest grade surface for iron work. Uh, if you want to get a better quality piece, you get rid of the forged surface by filing. And if you want to get rid of that medium grade surface and make a better quality piece, you polish. And if you want to get even better than that, you case harden and polish. So there are many, many grades of surface, each one better than forging or the one previous. And each one takes a significant amount of labor and sometimes more skill to achieve. So uh, these cooking utensils, a lot of the hardware have filed surfaces, and, uh, and that was to make them better than the lowest grade. Often they're just filed on the visible part because that's really what's important is you're making the visible part more uniform, smoother, more regular. And when it's new, bright in color. So it doesn't have that black appearance anymore either. Even if it's going to get painted over, a lot of old hardware gets installed on doors that are going to be painted. They buy better grade hardware, which is file bright, and then they just paint right over. So you can still see under the paint that it's not a rough forged surface, and so it's still a visible component, but the brightness of bright color isn't necessarily the end result. It's the smoother finish. Yeah? Peter, could you talk to us a little bit about what the material the blacksmith of that period had for? Sure, there, there are two materials that, well, I kind of harped on this yesterday with some people, but um, we all use the word blacksmith, but uh, that term historically meant one specific trade. And that, generally, that trade was the guy in the in a town who would do custom work and repairs. And that's really what a blacksmith was, and often shoeing too. Uh, you know, and sometimes those guys would call themselves blacksmith and farrier, but often they just call themselves blacksmith. And you look at their account books, and there's a significant amount of shoeing. The person that made nails was not a blacksmith, it was a 
nailer. And the person that made locks was not a blacksmith, he was a locksmith. Because generally the blacksmiths didn't make those kinds of things. They could make one or two maybe, but a blacksmith never made 300,000 nails in a year. You've got to be just a nailer to be able to do that. It takes years of making just nails and nothing else to get fast enough to do real nail production. And so the blacksmith is one of, well, probably 15 or 20 iron forging trades. But it's important to remember that uh, this kind of work was not done by a blacksmith either. Nor generally were these kinds of uh, everyday carpenter's tools. They were done by special manufacturing smiths. So the smiths that did this kind of work, that made gates and grills and railings, were called palisado smiths. Uh, smiths that made uh, bits and spurs, Stirrups were called Lorimers. Smiths that made uh, locks were called locksmiths, and sometimes more specialized than that, they were sometimes called padlock makers or stock lock makers. Uh, and these are the these are what they call themselves. These are the terms they use to describe themselves. If you call yourself a blacksmith, that meant you did kind of repair work, general repair work, and a few custom-made tools, farm tools, wagon parts, household things, but not, not a quantity manufacturer of anything. Peter, do they have all those different smiths at Williamsburg, or did the blacksmith do all those different trades? Uh, well, there's a third option. So were, were there all those trades in Williamsburg, or did the blacksmith do, make all those things? And the answer to both those questions is no. The Williamsburg had a population of about 2,000, and that was not a big enough community to support the Lorimer or a Palisado Smith. I think there were maybe two sets of gates in the whole town. There wasn't even enough population there to support a nailer. Uh, there were, at, at the time, at, probably at the peak, about six or seven shops that forged iron in one way or another. And two or three of them, well, a couple of them were farriers. Uh, several were blacksmiths that did, a, like I said, repair work, uh, farm made farm tools, uh, did some shoeing. Occasionally would make a key for a lock if you lost the key. Uh, then there were also one or two smiths called white smiths, whose work meant forged pieces that were sold and polished, were sold bright. So a white smith made a better grade of product than a blacksmith in terms of finish. And generally, the things that you find in a fancier house setting out in the farm field. So, so Whitesmiths made nicer grades of cooking equipment, and fireplace tools, and uh, some lighting, and some, what else? Well, nothing comes to mind. There was also, uh, there was for a short while, um, a guy came from England in 1770 set up and he called himself uh, they call himself a uh, gunsmith. He didn't get enough work apparently so six months later he puts another ad in the paper and he's a gunsmith and blacksmith. And that wasn't enough and so a year later he put another ad in the paper and he was a gunsmith, blacksmith and founder. And I think he probably dabbled in all of those things to start with, but where he had come from, which was Birmingham, England, you could be a just a one of those things and make a living. But in a tiny town, you couldn't just be one of those things. You had to do a little of everything. So in a 
bigger city, you would find 15 different trades. In Philadelphia, you would find blacksmiths, whitesmiths, cutlers, maybe scissors and knives, maybe even sword cutlers, who specialized even further. You'd find whitesmiths, you'd find locksmiths, you'd find uh, maybe palisado smiths, you'd find tire smiths, they were called the smiths that did all the vehicle hardware, which was, I'm not talking about a buckboard, I'm talking about coaches now, which are very fancy vehicles. And, and, uh, Smiths that did that great, that work were often regarded as the best Smiths in the, in the field. The requirement for coach iron work was incredibly fancy and stylish and the lightest possible at the same time. So very, very skilled work. Um, so the third option in Williamsburg, because there wasn't enough market to have all those trades, blacksmith couldn't, wasn't knowledgeable enough to make all those things, was to bring the stuff in from somewhere else. And that was probably a big, uh, common phenomenon all up and down the East Coast. So Williamsburg is on two ocean, two rivers that are deep enough for ocean-going vessels. And so there were ships docking near Williamsburg at least every week. 50 or 60 ships a year coming from England with cargoes of manufactured goods. And, and bringing the Virginia exports back to England, those were tobacco and corn and wood, wood in lots of forms, lumber, uh, gun stocks, barrel staves, wheel spokes, all the kinds of things that were needed in manufacturing. Uh, they also brought iron from Virginia back to England because the iron was one of the big exports of Virginia and, and England couldn't make enough internally to supply their own industry. So the English were importing iron and getting it from one of their own colonies was the best arrangement they could offer. Uh, what else was exported? Uh, furs. Deer skins, uh, humor, uh, all, all the kinds of uh, sort of agrarian and, and basic industrial material products were being exported from Virginia back to England. So people in England were used, well, people in, in Williamsburg were very accustomed to seeing the latest kind of manufactured goods from the biggest industrial centers in England. And they would see them every week a new ship would come in. So when you live in a, an environment like that, you know, a local blacksmith who can say, well, I can't make one as nice as this, but I can make one that's a lot cruder and heavier. And, oh, I have to charge more, too. <laughs> There's just no incentive for people to go to a local blacksmith and get something like this when you can walk down to the store by one that was much better made for a third less money. You know, and why was it better made? Because the guy that made these in England made a hundred a week, not one of them every month, but a hundred every week, and he could get so good and uniform and consistent at it. So, so that's that's why it's important to remember what the blacksmith's role is within this context. Um, and I'll, I haven't forgotten your question. What materials did Smiths have to work with? Uh, they had basically two materials to work with. A high carbon steel, which was, you could buy at different grades, and that was suitable for hammer faces or chisel edges or, well, anything that needed to be hardened. Uh, springs, uh, what else? So, well, a lot of, uh, Agricultural tools are faced with that steel, uh, you know, plow chairs or even uh, hoes for, for hand cultivation, uh, axes. Uh, so all those things would have a little piece of high carbon steel in them for the cutting edge or the wear surface. And 
then the other materials were all iron. So just those two. And, and they suffice for every single ferrous metal thing that's forged. And then the other material that was available at the time, the ferrous metal, was cast iron. So there are a bunch of things that are normally made of cast iron. Uh, big cooking kettles, pots, those are the ones that are easy to imagine. Uh, fire backs, which are just a thick cast iron plate you set against the back wall of your fireplace to help radiate heat and, uh, and keep the fire from deteriorating the brick. Yeah? Did the high carbon steel come from England or did they manufacture it? I don't, I think all the steel came from England. I don't think there was any significant steel manufacturer in the American colonies. And, you know, I've just found this book from 1851 called Manufacture of Steel. And even in 1851, the author says there's almost no steel made in America. So, so steel making was, uh, was not a, a really well developed industry. Until probably up until the Civil War period. Uh, but when you're talking about uh, what kinds of things were being forged at the time, probably the you know wrought iron, you know of all the material that's used in a year, for example, in a shop that's doing work like this, wrought iron would be 99 percent of the material steel might be one percent. So it's a very small amount and, and it was really expensive. Uh, so a tool like a hammer would just have a thin face of steel on each hand. And the majority of the material is iron. Do you ever find those hammers? Uh, steel faced hammers? Occasionally. Well, uh, you can find them in antique stores often, but it's hard to tell how old they are when you buy them that way. So what we really hoped for were archaeological finds. And I think probably we have three or four archaeological finds, hammers with, with steel bases. And then, uh, well, in Mount Vernon they found the face off came off. It wasn't welded properly, so the face came off after some use and they, that ended up in the ground. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so let's see, in that lock, the spring is steel. That's the only piece that's steel. Uh, in a common door lock, there's even less steel than there is in that lock. There are two springs in a common Everything else is raw iron. Uh, Peter? Uh, even in a gun, you know, the amount of steel is minimal. There are two, two springs, three springs in, in the flintlock. <laughs> yeah, the prison, the main spring, and the sear spring. And those are, that's all the steel there is in the flintlock. The barrel would have been rock? The barrels were iron. Peter, uh, what was the carbon content of high carbon steel then? Is it comparable yeah, what to? Was the, uh, what was the carbon content of the steel? I have no idea. Uh, I don't know anyone that's done an analysis of surviving pieces. It, it has to be destructive analysis. That's the problem. Uh, I know there's been a fair amount of work done on ancient blades, but there's no one's bothered to do that on tools. So I don't know. I'm gonna my guess is it's somewhere between fifty and ninety points. Is the thought that it was consistent in you know from and if you look at a dozen axes that all had steel bits in it with the carbon content of those be consistent, do you suspect? I suspect they would not be anywhere near consistent. 
So I think they're really inconsistent. Uh, so the way the, the, the there, there was one common way to make steel, you would, you would make wrought iron bar, and it's uh, they call it cementation or cementing. You pack these bars in a in a box within a furnace. The boxes are stone or iron, and you pack the bars in charcoal, ground up charcoal. And uh, you might put two tons of bars in one box at a time. And then you put a lid on it, and you heat up the whole box to glowing. And you hold it there for several days, and you let it cool. Carbon in the charcoal gets absorbed into the iron because it's a lack of oxygen in the environment. Uh, and so that was sold just as is. That was called blister steel because it actually raised blisters on the surface of the bar. Uh, and it's the most uneven. The surface of the bar generally has more carbon than the coal. <laughs> So even within the, you take any any section of that bar, and it's going to be even throughout its cross section, and maybe uneven along its length as well. Would it penetrate all the way to the center to some degree? Yeah. Some would get the Yeah. Yeah. So then people knew that was irregular. They didn't know. Well, they didn't know it was carbon that was the issue. But there really wasn't atomic theory at that point. So they thought, actually, if you read early in the middle of the 1700s metallurgy books, they assume that the iron is being purified in order to make steel because it's a brighter color and it's a more homogeneous material. So there wasn't even the idea that you were adding something to iron to make it into steel. Their theory was the opposite. You were taking something out of iron so they had no way really of analyzing the, other than by a visual inspection. You could quench that bar and break it, and you could see that it was different on the surface of the core. And you could tell by working it too. So they had they knew it was irregular, but it was the lowest price. That's the lowest price steel you can buy. If you want better steel, we, we can improve it several ways. Cost more, and the first way they could do that was to uh, fold that bar and weld the stack and draw it back out again. Or they would actually cut off the bar and stack it and weld it. But that was called shear steel. So if you do that once, you take that bar and you shear it up into four or five pieces and stack it and weld it and draw it all out back to the same dimension. That's shear steel, single shear. You could do it again, cut that welded stack, stack it up again, weld it again, and draw it again. That was double shear. That was more uniform than single shear. And then the, the best way of making the steel homogeneous back then was to take the original blister steel Put it in a crucible and remelt it, and not add or subtract anything. Just melt it, and then you have a homogeneous mix of whatever was in there to start with. And then that you get a ingot from that melt, which you would forge into the bar. And that was called cast steel. You guys, any of you, find old tools. A lot of them will say stamped right on, cast steel. Well, that was the best grade of steel at the time, so that's an advertisement for the quality of the tool you're buying. It doesn't mean the tool is cast. It means the process for making the steel was cast steel, and then subsequently everything is forged. You still have a cast steel bit forge welded onto an iron tool body. Just like you could do the same procedure with blister steel, or you could do the same procedure with shear steel. So cast steel just gave the most uniform results in 
people knew that by trial, not by analysis. Okay, when they did the blister steel, that was pure iron, not raw. That was raw iron. So it had so it it's had silica in it, right? And and it so was that that stayed that's still there? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer for that completely. My understanding is some of the silica comes out. You still have a grain in the bar, but it's not as pronounced as the grain in the raw iron bar was. But if you did the cast steel, you probably lose. No grain in the cast steel. No visible, you know, laminar grain. And if you make shear steel out of that blister steel, you still have grain, visible grain in the steel more evenly distributed. So if you you can find if you're really if you look at old iron and tools a lot, you can find tools that are marked shear steel. And if you if you match the steel in those you can see the grain that looks like raw iron grain. But it's really that that blade is steel got carbon in it. So so yeah, some of the steel did have grain that made that steel much easier to weld to a piece of iron or to itself. So people talk about how much easier it is to weld cast steel or I mean weld a blister steel or shear steel than it is to weld cast steel. Not only would it weld more securely, but it would, could be heated to a higher temperature. So the cast steel had some real disadvantages when it was new, but it was the most homogeneous product. Uh, so getting back to wrought iron, uh, I, made, I made this piece completely out of wrought iron, and I'm going to try to do all my demo here this week with wrought iron, which I brought with me. My thumb in there for scale. <laughs> I do hope you found that interesting. Peter Ross is certainly one of the blacksmiths who I admire the most who is the most inspiring to me because he is such a skilled and knowledgeable smith within his particular specialty, which is 18th century ironwork. And he is truly a master of wrought iron, which is what this entire scroll is made out of vintage wrought iron that he has reforged into this wonderful piece. If you enjoyed that and found it useful, I hope you give it a thumbs up. Love it if you hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. Do stick around, watch some of the other videos. If you can put up with the uh, less than ideal audio and filming situation from the conference, go back and watch Peter forge some of this. You can see some of these scrolls take place. I think mostly it's this outer scroll and this little forge welded leaf that you actually get to see on that video. But anyways, I think it's worth watching. If not, watch some of the other videos. But then make time in your day to get out to the shop Make something, but do stay safe, do wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.